Hello, my name is Christine Curry, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator for the Isaac Walton League's Upper Mississippi River Initiative, also known as UMRI. I'm also a board member of the Isaac Walton League's Panora Chapter and the Des Moines Chapter. Thank you all for joining our first program of the 2021 series on soil and water conservation, Thinking Like a Watershed. Before we begin, I would like to give a big shout out and a thank you to Christina Dexter from the Iowa Farmers Union for all her help with Zoom technology. I would also like to share a recent post from our website. We are on a mission to promote and expand positive activities that are taking place in the watershed with our partners. Our hope is that our positive examples will be contagious and encourage others to get involved and take action so that eventually the entire Upper Mississippi River watersheds will flourish with healthy landscapes, soil, and clean water from Minnesota to the Gulf of Mexico. The UMRI is an Isaac Walton League program that includes the states of Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Illinois. We'd like to recognize UMRI's Executive Director, Dave Zentner from Minnesota, and thank the other members of our team who you will meet throughout the series. This evening, our co-hosts include Isaac Walton League's Save Our Streams Coordinator, Zach Moss, Des Moines Chapter Communications Coordinator, Bud Hartley, and Panora Conservation Chapter Member, Chris Henning. All will be helping with this evening's program. And now, Isaac Walton League's Agriculture Outreach Coordinator, Tim Wagner, will introduce this evening's presenter. And then last year, I believe it was, we, uh, uh, Wayne was uh, gracious enough to allow me to do a uh, phone interview with him uh, uh, for about two hours, one cold February morning, and that resulted in an article that I wrote about him that appeared in uh, our Outdoors America uh, uh, national magazine that ran last year. And I think, Christine, you probably posted that article in the UMRI website article that you had sent around. And, um, but if anybody hasn't seen that, um, you can find it if you go to iwla.org, find the media tab and scroll down through Outdoors America and you will find the article about Wayne. Uh, Wayne is just, just, you know, he's been doing this stuff for a long time. And he uh, has become a real champion, of course, being long involved with both the Iowa Soybean Association and the National Soybean Association. And uh, he just has a credible voice uh, about these issues because he knows uh, from experience. And, um, and I don't think without any further ado, I'll just turn it over to Wayne. So Wayne, it's, it's your podium here. Go for it. Okay, well, thanks, Tim. And am I coming through, Claire? You bet. Okay, good. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, Tim. Um, it, it's always good to be able to sit down with, I'd say, a non-farm audience and have a conversation about conservation. And every farmer has a story. And, and you're going to hear my story tonight. I think it's, it's a value to you know, to, to know how some farmers think and how decisions evolve and, and, and come from our uh, a way of doing business. And uh, so we'll, we'll cover a little of the history, the story, how we got involved and engaged in conservation. We'll do a deep dive into a lot of the data we've been able to collect because farmers are per se data driven. And that's what drives what happens on their farms and operations. So we're gonna share with you a lot of the data we've uncovered and then we'll We'll conclude with some parting thoughts and, and open it up for uh, questions at that time. So um, at this time, we're, I'm going to share with you, you know, my soil health story. My wife and I, we started farming in the early 70s up here in northern Iowa, where the star is in the map. And, and to many people, that's considered just south of the North Pole. Uh, that part of the state is, is cold and and oftentimes uh, not considered to be conducive to things such as cover crop or, or no-till, but 
you know, over the period of time, we've learned how to make it work in, in that part of the state. But I do want to remind all of my listeners that for the first 19 years of my farming career, we were fully a conventional farmer. We plowed all of our corn stalks going to soybeans, and we worked all of our bean stubble, you know, going to corn. But what changed? And that was the advent of no-till soybeans. And it was in the winter uh, of 91, 92 that we actually froze up early. We couldn't get our fall plowing done. And, and I was sitting in my office in December, just trying to decide, you know, how are we gonna move forward the following spring? When I happened to run across an article about a young man in Southwest Minnesota, who was no tilling soybeans with a John Deere drill. And that intrigued me, it just caught my mind. And I thought, Boy, if that's something that would work, that would, you know, kind of solve my dilemma that I was in. And in a conversation in January with my local John Deere dealer, I found out he happened to be getting one of those drills into their dealership. And, and he says, it's, it's going to be available if you want to try and use it. And so we did. And after the first field, things worked so well that we continued and we eventually drilled all of our fields that spring. That summer, they grew well. Uh, we control was excellent. Um, they looked good, they harvested well, and most importantly, they yielded very well. Folks, I was an instant convert to no-till soybeans in one fell swoop. And now we use a planter such as this, and you know our goal is to be able to establish a beautiful stand of beans, still keep that residue out there to protect the soil and, and the landscape and help build soil health and structure. But more recently, We've took on the challenges of growing cover crops uh, because we believe in the benefits. And so this becomes our goal in the spring is to, to be able to grow a healthy cover crop like this is cereal rye. We plant directly into that. And this is what you see 35 days later. You got a beautiful stand of soybeans, the soil's protected. We got good weed control and things are off to a good start. Strip till corn came about a decade later, and you might ask why. Well, as we started no-tilling soybeans, then you start going to meetings, no-till meetings, and learning more from your fellow farmers, from educational meetings that ISU was putting on. And the conversation always went around like, oh, great, you're no-tilling soybeans. What are you doing for corn? Well, as we looked at no-till corn yields in, in Northern Iowa, and I would look at the two ISU research, I, and when I say ISU, I mean Iowa State University, I would look at their two research farms at uh, one to the west and one to the east, and no-till corn didn't do very well. It didn't look like a profitable solution. But about that time in the late 90s, strip-till came on the horizon. And that was the, the minimized tillage of a very narrow strip in which we would place our nitrogen and or pardon me my phosphorus and potash at about five six inches depth and this would be the the resulting um effort after we strip tilled in the fall come spring i would no till right on the very top of those narrowly narrowly worked strips we would find those strips to be seven to ten degrees warmer than the middles they would be drier they would be every bit as much ready and fit to plant as any of the conventionally worked soils in the area. And so it worked real well, especially being in Northern Iowa where our growing season's a little bit shorter and, and it's important that we get our crops in early. But this was our ultimate goal. We get a beautiful stand of corn uh, coming up very uniform and yet we had that protection for the soil. We was, was protecting that from the elements. But as in soybeans, we also adopted cover crops ahead of corn. And this here is where we're no-tilling corn into a cover crop of standing rye. We're still utilizing strip till. That's why you see kind of the lines there in that rye is it's created because of the strips. But a month later, this is your ultimate goal. You've got that beautiful stand of corn. You've got, uh, again, the soil very well protected and you can see the decomposing rye. We also have other farm practices on our farm just to, you know, you know, accentuate that we're involved in other things. Our first cooperative effort with NRCS was actually back in 1984 when they helped design and cost share this grove. Every tree you see in this picture was planted by myself, except for that maple in the upper right hand corner. 
We also have a lot of waterways on the farms that we farm. Even though we're as flat as you can see here, there's a need for waterways in a lot of those critical areas, especially when these heavy downfalls we get. In fact, in the last two years, we put in two new waterways with the work and help of S S -E -R NRCS. We had the first bioreactor in Mitchell County in Rock Creek watershed. And, and for those of you unfamiliar with a bioreactor, it's simply a chip of wood chip or a pit of wood chips that we divert tile drainage water into and the microbial action removes the nitrate from that water. So when the water exits, it's pretty much free of nitrates. And so it's a good way to minimize the amount of nitrate concerns in, in our rivers and streams. And I've also been actively involved in pollinator work and sit on the National Monarch Pollinator Collaborative. And we've got seven strategically placed pollinator habitats on our land. So let's get into economics. And I wanna emphasize, these are my farm, my figures. And they can be different for every farmer. No two farmers have the same economic uh, issues to deal with. I had the opportunity through our accounting system and we're in a computerized accounting system. We work with a company out of Illinois, but we were invited to participate in a benchmarking group. And there was 86 farmers in this group that were row crop farmers in the Midwest. I was one of the few that would you might call no-till strip till. The majority were all conventional tillage. In other words, they were using a lot more tillage practices in their operations. But over that eight year period of time, when we sat down and benchmark and compared our, our cost figures, I had a, on average a $44 lower cost than my counterparts who were basically in conventional till. And it's just a simple matter of fact, when you, when you go to no till or strip till, you, you just don't have the equipment cost, you don't have the trips over the field, the fuel expenditure and so forth. It does save you cost or it does save you money. Over that same eight year period of time, we also showed a savings in labor that amounted to about $27 an acre. Again, a very significant, significant savings. The next chart is, is something that I, you know, we stumbled on, we keep a lot of data and sometimes you just sit down and put that data down and, and lo and behold, something evolves out of that. And when I put, went back and I looked at uh, organic matter uh, changes that occurred on our farms over a period of time. This is the result of that effort. You know, we started farming in the early 70s. And in 1984, the crop consultant that I was working with said that when we pull our soil samples, let's also do a organic matter test so that we can see what herbicide rates to use. Other than that, we don't need to, uh, you know, father with it anymore. And for those of you unfamiliar with organic matter, and it's about 58% carbon. So when we start talking about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and so forth, organic matter is composed about 58% actual carbon. So the next decade, we adopted no-till and strip-till as I alluded to before. And the next time we pulled organic matter samples was in 2007. And as you can see here on the chart, they, they kind of went up some. And I thought that was significant. Five years later, we we saw uh, you know, a continued increase. And again, in 2015, uh, we saw a slightly more increase. But when I sat down and looked at it over a period of time, over about 25 years, we saw a 2.5% increase in organic matter on these farms. And that was primarily from the discontinuing of our full width tillage. And if I reached out to Iowa State or uh, University of Illinois or University of Minnesota, all those agronomists would tell you the same thing, that if you discontinue full width tillage, you could in this latitude probably accomplish that one tenth of 1% per year increase in organic matter as we've shown here. A couple of years ago, I actually went out and, and done an analysis of the fence rows on these farms. And for though you unfamiliar in this part of the country, the fence rows were established when these farms were bought from the government in the 1860s. And so there has been no tillage on those fence rows. So they would be indicative of what the the historic uh, organic matter levels was of the prairie at that time. And it varied from six to 9%, 6 percent related to that light green farm and nine the other two. And as I looked at that, I thought, well, you know, I got potential to go up some, but the sad story here is that over a period of time for when, whence we began tillage, we actually destroyed two thirds of the 
the parent organic matter that was in those fields before tillage began. We went from six down to two and nine down to three. That was just tremendously destructive. And it took me about 25 years to get half of that back. And so I wondered, well, you know, is this just indicative of my farms or is there any other supporting data for that, for that comment? And I reached out to uh, uh, Marty Ocasi from Iowa State, the soil scientist down there, and he sent me the next three slides. And in this slide just shows, uh, you know, looking at the moral plots in Illinois and in the, in the plots in Sanborn, Missouri, on the left graph, you see the the percent of soil carbon from native, which would be going back, uh, decreased considerably from that, you know, that 100% point over a period of time uh, significantly. We've seen some dramatic decreases since the beginning of tillage. This is a chart that's from the ISU research farms. There's seven Iowa State University research farms across Iowa, um, three across the top of the state, three across the bottom, one in the center at Ames, but they are all strategically located in the different soil associations of the state. And so that the farmers that farm in those particular areas of the state can reach out to more localized data, which is derived from those research farms that is managed by Iowa State University. But this was a 12 year study of soil organic carbon based on tillage at these research farms. And if you look in yellow, basically what we're saying here is that we've had a organic matter change and most of it's occurred in the top 12 inches. But if we look at the tillage practices that we're talking about, the first two that go above the line are either no-till or strip-till. The next three tillage practices that go negative or below the line are chisel plow, deep rip, or moldboard plow all practices that are quite commonly used on the landscape. As we look at the next chart, this gives us an opportunity to look at the extent of that loss. And basically here again, under the no-till strip-till scenario, if we look at the two uh, you know, items of, of discussion on the left, we saw that the average soil organic carbon gain for those practices was about two tenths of a ton per year per acre. If we look at the practices such as chisel plow, deep rip or moldboard plow, we saw an average soil organic carbon loss of approximately a quarter of a ton per acre per year. So as we have entered into this new administration that's talking about climate, we're talking about carbon dioxide and the ability of the soils to either store carbon or release carbon. This is a classic picture of what happens, especially when you get under different tillage scenarios. Now, does it matter? And, and so I, I reached out trying to find information about has somebody put down a value to soil organic matter. And I found this uh, brochure this, uh, that was done by the Iowa Division of the NRCS. And in this brochure, they give me the incremental value of 1% of soil organic matter. And to start with, they give an enhanced water availability value of $18 an acre per year. And as you noticed in the printage, I got the 2080 rule. And I'll attribute that 2080 rule to Dr. Jerry Hatfield and his team of researchers at USDA Agricultural Research service there in Ames, Iowa. And I've been a friend of Jerry for years and uh, I've heard Jerry speak many times. But Jerry has often said in his presentations that we lose 20% of our potential yield 80% of the time because of the lack of water availability. I'll repeat that. We lose 20% of our potential yield 80% of the time. That's like comparing 240 bushel corn to 200 bushel corn or 60 bushel beans to 50 bushel beans. And the reason behind that thinking and, the, and, and why organic matter is so important is that if we improve our soil structure because of enhanced organic matter, it allows more rainfall to be absorbed into the soil and held in the soil. And it becomes available in typically that July, August timeframe when our crop is really 
growing and, and trying to put on bushels and yield, fill those ears and fill those pods. And that's often a time when it gets hot and dry in Iowa. And this is where that organic matter, that ability to, to enhance yield is, is created by this enhanced organic matter. It also has fertility value, a value of N and P of $11. And more recently, Ohio State and Kansas State University uh, in further study, put an additional dollar worth of value on there for the sulfur that is in that. But anyway, we look at a total value per 1% organic matter as about $29 per acre per year. And my simple math started to kick in my head and I said, well, I've increased it on my farm by two and a half percent. That should mean that farm on an annual basis has the capacity to be more productive by about $72 per acre per year versus my neighbors right across the fence with the same soil that has continued to do full with tillage. That's kind of an awesome thought. Now, if you capitalize that by 5%, you take 20 times that 72, you're looking at over $1,400 an acre that my farm ought to be worth more than my neighbor's farm right across the fence who has continued to do full with tillage. We haven't taken that discussion about the value of organic matter that far yet in Iowa, and, but it's something that I try to, to elevate in my discussion all the time because I think it really matters. And uh, I think we'll see more of that evolve in discussion down the road. So as I look at my system economics, I'll look at my equipment cost advantage at 44, my labor advantage at 27. The value of that organic matter, I'm gonna put in there at 72. I'm going to put my cover crop cost in there at minus 27 because we're going to take a, take a deeper dive in that. But I still have a net value of $116 an acre over my neighbor who has continued to do things, you know, conventionally. Cover crop, is it really worth 27, you know, minus 27? Well, first of all, why would I consider cover crops if I already know that I'm going to take a $27 hit? It was an evolution of thought. You know, back in, in June 2008, this is the view outside of my home after we had about a six inch rain. Uh, we're sitting here on a little bitty tributary to the Cedar River, and it's normally a dry stream. And uh, for, for a few hours, we had Lakeshore property. A day later in Charles City, Iowa on the Cedar River. Five days later in Cedar Rapids one of the most devastating floods in history. It's in my watershed. And it really, you know, became apparent to me that it's not only the quality of the water that I might affect with my farming practices, but it's also the quantity. And I'll tell you, on this day, those people could care less about nitrates. It was the quantity of the water that was coming down upon them. And that I, you know, it really became apparent that the practices that I have on my land can affect both in a big way. I got elected to the Iowa Soybean Board in 2008. And with that, I got heavily involved working with the on-farm network. And then that network, we began doing cover crop trials in 2012. We, you know, this was just starting to happen to talk about cover crops. We were trying to learn about how to plant them, when to plant them, what species to plant, how to terminate them, what effect they had on crop yields, and, and what type of, of herbicide programs was going to be necessary. It was a learning process because we had nothing to go by uh, regarding cover crops. In 2013, Iowa adopted the nutrient reduction strategy, and most of us are well aware of the, the reasons behind that, and that was to address the nutrient overload in the Gulf of Mexico and that hypoxy zone. That same year, my watershed, Rock Creek Watershed, adopted its watershed plan. In fact, we were the first watershed in Iowa to adopt a plan based upon the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy. I was one of the advising members to that group and one of the farmers that participated in that plan making. <clears throat> Excuse me. But as we look at the, 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 the nutrient reduction strategy, we see the huge benefits that we can reduce nitrates with a cover crop here, 30, you know, 30% 30 basically in that plan. If we look at the reduction of phosphate, again, another 30% reduction. And, and I noticed that 90% reduction that comes from, you know, no-till no planting versus conventional, you know, chisel plowing and so forth. So it's tremendous 
responses we can get here by a change of practices. And that, and that really got, you know, something exciting for me. You know, as we moved into, you know, successive years, you know, every farm periodical or magazine we pick up nowadays, there's a discussion about soil health. You know, it's soil, soil health has just become elevated to being part of our everyday conversation. And yet it's, it's, it's one of those elusive, sometimes hard to describe things. But I think what really drove me into heavy cover crop usage was this just very unfortunate event. And that was the Des Moines lawsuit against farmers in, the, in Northwest Iowa. That was in 2016, 15 and 16. I was president of Iowa Soybean Association during 2016, the second year of this lawsuit. And it was, it was devastating to see the, the, the division that was being created between rural and urban because of this, this discussion. And it, it became apparent upon me that um, farmers could step up and could do more and, th and there's a learning process in here. And I took it upon myself to really get engaged in, in the cover crops and moving forward. And so cover crops in our system. This is 2016. After we started began experimenting in 2012 and 2016, I was bold enough to plant all of my soybeans into this. And I'll tell you, we had two fields uh, happened to be one on Highway 9 and one on Highway 218. We drew a lot of attention and not all of it positive. I had a lot of farmers that were relatively upset with me doing this. I think maybe they felt if I was successful, the expectations of them would be above and beyond. But it was interesting on this particular field because we had been doing uh, uh, tile drainage water sampling because we anticipated, you know, participating and learning more about nitrates and drainage water and so forth. And, and so in 2014, two years prior to this, our, our tile water samples, we had two of them, averaged 13.23 milligrams per liter of nitrate. And I think most of you on this call or on webinar are aware that 10.0 is the drinking water standard. We were over that, but not unusual for this landscape. In 2015, this field was in corn. You've already got more nitrogen involved in that aspect. But we had a samples of 13.9, about 14 milligrams per liter of nitrate. 2016, planting into that 30 inch cereal rye, we had seven samples taken on this farm. 4.17 milligrams per liter of nitrate. Folks, that's a tremendous reduction. I don't know if I contributed at all to the cereal rye, but I'm going to give it a big thumbs up because it dramatically reduce the amount of nitrates coming out of that field tile. Can we repeat this? So in 27, on this particular farm, in the background is Rock Creek. That's our watershed name, but Rock Creek is in the background where those trees are. This farm was pattern tiled in 2005. There's in other words, a drainage tile every 70 foot in this farm. Two of them happened to drain right into that road ditch where you see the grass on the end of this field. And we were part again of, of tile water sampling on this farm. I planted this field too in May in tall green cereal rye. When they pulled those samples, 3.22 milligrams per liter and 3.46 milligrams per liter of nitrate. Dramatically lower than what historically came off of this farm. But I happened to ask the gentleman who was doing the tile sampling, I said, do you happen to know what Rock Creek is testing? And he said, yes, about 10 milligrams per liter of nitrate. And it was an aha moment to me. It's like, wow. I don't think we'd have had the Des Moines Water Works lawsuit if we'd have had a much broader expanse of cover crops in this state, because look at the dramatic reduction here. I'm actually taking tile water off a highly productive field and putting it into the river and making it cleaner. You don't hear that story about tile drainage water in Iowa. It's usually the opposite. It's about making conditions worse. Folks, cover crops can do a tremendous amount of good when it comes to this. This, this is just a summary of, of all the tiles that have been sampled by the Iowa Soybean Association on cover crops versus no cover crops. And they see a 4.2 milligrams per liter lower concentration under cover crop. So we know the practice works. 
But we've also seen other production benefits that have come to our farm. And I wanna share some of them with you. First of all, you know, that to kind of lead into the scenario here, you know, I mentioned Dr. Jerry Hatfield earlier in the conversation. And I was asked to give a presentation to National NRCS here a year and a half ago. And, and prior to that, I reached out to Dr. Hatfield and just wanted to, you know, expand my dis thoughts and discussion about what certain things I should want to cover in that presentation. And the conversation kind of turned around and Jerry, he said, Wayne, would you have any and be willing to share any of your digital yield data? We had this hypothesis that we would like to study, but we need some digit, actual on-farm digital yield data. In other words, the data we collect when we harvest off of our yield monitor. And I thought for a moment, how many farmers are willing to give all that data to USDA? But I knew Jerry and his team very well. And I thought, wow, what an opportunity to have another set of eyes look at that data. And so I said, yeah, I'd gladly send you that. A couple of weeks later, he called and he said, would you happen to have your rainfall data? And I said, yeah, it wouldn't take me too long to get it. Um, my wife's one of them old fashioned ones. We got a calendar on the wall. Every time it rains, we write it down and we've got every calendar since we got married. And so it didn't take too, it took me about three hours and I put it on an Excel spreadsheet and sent it to Jerry. But when I printed this data out, and this is from 2001 until this last year, we are looking at five more inches of rainfall that is coming in that April, September timeframe. The time when we have to be out there attending to crops, planting to crops, caring for crops. Folks, we can't farm the same way we used to with this much more rainfall. This chart a year ago showed seven inches, but we was in a drought last year. So that took a couple off the average, but it makes a significant difference on what we do on the land. This is what Jerry did with that data. They done a, a geostatistical analysis, which man, don't get lost in this chart because I'm gonna break this down and make it easier. But basically they're looking at data points everywhere in that field with every type of soil and base it with yield and, and weather and so forth. What we come up with with this analysis, and this makes a lot more sense. And, and on the left-hand axis is frequency of percent. But this is the frequency of where yields fall in this field and the yield curve is on the bottom. And so you see yields in 2004, that's the black lines, basically running from 50 bushel an acre to 250 bushel an acre across that field. That is the distribution of yield. 2018, we got a higher curve and I'm gonna attribute genetics to some of that, but look at how much narrower that curve is. We have narrowed the distribution of yields. It's an interesting concept. This is a soybean geotatistical analysis. This is looking at the soybean yields. Again, in 2004, we got this beautiful distribution of yields from 20 to 80 bushel. That's a 60 bushel spread. 2018, 40 bushel spread. We've took 20 bushel, reduced the variation in yield by 20 bushel. And basically what we're saying is that over time as we have adopted soil health practices and, and brought cover crops into the picture, we've reduced the variability across that field. And it has become more productive. The good spots especially have improved. We reduced our risk and it opens up another concept and thought. We look at this particular spot in a normal bell curve and if you're looking at it from a crop insurance perspective, that is the area of most risk. And we have engaged with the crop insurance industry through RMA and FSA and USDA to do an analysis of farms that have adopted soil health practices and cover crops to see if we warrant a better insurance rate. It's kind of like the good driver discount. This is an ongoing study, I'm part of that. And this is something we're looking at because in essence, if, if we've adopted these practices, we shouldn't have to be, we aren't as risky and we shouldn't have to pay the higher rates. If we look at our whole farm yields versus county average and farmers always wanna know this, I, I, you know, my yields are in orange and the county average is in red. And this is strip till we started, as I said, from 2001 and up to the current time. 
first couple of years looked really good. And then, whoa, bing, where that red arrow is, you wonder, what the heck happened? Well, it's a learning curve. And there's learning curves to adopting conservation, and not all the time do you win. Uh, we had come from a nitrogen program of where we would spray our UAN and herbicide on the surface and till it in with tillage, but we quit tilling in 2001. Rainfall will do the same thing. And in the first couple of years, we got timely rainfall and it took care of that. But the next three years, our rainfall wasn't timely enough to, to fully fix our nitrogen, and we lost some to the atmosphere. Uh, as, as simple as that. And so in 2007, we finally purchased our own side dress applicator so we could culture inject that nitrogen in the soil. And from that point forward, then our nitrogen management was, was as good as any. And, and that from that time on, our yields tracked right along with, with county yield. But it was interesting to also go back and do an analysis of fertilizer investment. And I went back and looked at all of my phosphorus and potash expenses over that time period on a yearly basis and compared it with an Iowa State University crop budgets on a yearly basis and noticed that we invested almost $9 per acre less in phosphorus and potassium. And as you can see, our yields tracking just fine, assuming that the county average is, is doing the same thing. We look at soybean yields, again, our yields in orange and, and county in red, and, and this is no-till since 92. This has always worked for us very well. In fact, that particular year, 2016, where we had our highest record yield was also the year we, first year we planted in that 30 inch tall cereal rye on every acre of soybeans. So we're showing, and, then, and when I give this to farmers, the main message I'm trying to get across is that you can adopt these conservation practices and your yields are not gonna fall apart. You're still gonna be competitive yield wise and you're gonna save cost. And so it, it works out economically, but most of them, their fear is, is that we adopt some of these new conservation practices and they can't be competitive on yield. Again, just reemphasizing the savings on, on phosphorus. This was an article that was in our local paper here in November. This good friend of mine, Dean Spahn, he farms oh, about five miles from me. He runs the cover crop business in this area. He's also my pioneer dealer. But he's got an 80 that he's been doing uh, split across the application of, of cover crops and no cover crops. And he's been at this as long as I've been in the cover crop business. And this year, and we were in the dry drought period up here, not not as bad as very Western Iowa, but we were drought, we saw drought stress. He saw a difference of 24 bushel of corn and over four bushel of beans on, on, that, on that split trial over on his farm. So um, this has often been said that as we build resiliency into our systems that uh, we can be very competitive on yield. So as we look at other critter crop and system benefits, you know, I'll, uh, we can reduce our phosphate losses and it also helps release in grain soil phosphate that's in the system. Saving fertilizer costs. Now, SARE is a Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Division of the United States Department of Agriculture. They said in their report that came out here last summer that on average farmers that are, are using cover crops can save $21 on fertility costs. And I got parentheses there. I've got 27 accounted for in my calculations. So I'm not gonna uh, add any more here. Better weed control, especially with resistant weeds. Sarah again suggests that farmers should be able to save $10. We have budgeted $11 this last year and, and we had very good control. Reduce soil loss, Sarah says two, we're gonna take the two. Help build soil structure. And this is something that's been very beneficial. Uh, Two and three years ago, we had extremely wet falls, especially throughout Iowa. Those farmers that have adopted cover crops and, and, and reduced tillage and so forth, we had no difficulty in harvesting. We were not cutting deep ruts and tracks trying to get our crop out. Those farmers that were still conventional or deep till were struggling with that tremendously. And they were cutting ruts and, and using excessive fuel to get crop harvested. Help many soil moisture. And as I mentioned, we're getting five more inches of rain. A lot of times that's coming in May when we want to plant. I find value to have that living cover crop out there to help manage my soil moisture. 
it's using up that excess moisture and helps create a, a seed bed that's more plantable. And, and that tool gives me that benefit. Increased air exchange in the soil. If you often see yellow looking corn, that's why. And, and we don't see that now with our cover crops. Rapidly add to soil biology. When I took agronomy in the early 70s, it was sand, silt, clay, N, P, and K, and, and pH. There was no discussion about biology or bugs. Folks, that is the most vibrant area of study today in agronomy, and that's soil biology. There's so much we're gonna learn from there that we're just touching the surface of. Anchor residue in place. Again, you get a four or five inch rain, corn stalks float, float up. And if there's nothing there to anchor them, they're gonna end up in your road ditches, plugging up culverts and bridges and tile, and I'm making a heck of a mess for your county road crews. Cover crop, a decent growing cover crop helps keep that anchored in place so it doesn't float away in a heavy rain. Provide a physical barrier between the tires and the soil. You know, we got to do out there and make herbicide applications in a timely basis. And if you got a wet season, the cover crop's like a carpet. It helps, it helps you get through the field and sometimes you couldn't do that in a conventional situation. Harvest carbon for additional four months of the year. And, and as we get into the latter discussion of this presentation, it's all about carbon moving forward. I mean, this administration, it's climate, it's carbon dioxide, it's carbon. Cover crops are the only way farmers can participate in, in that additional harvest of carbon. We can provide ecosystem services. And I qualify for the crop insurance discount of $5 an acre. Uh, I've you know, utilized any other cost share benefits I can get. So I, I get that one. And this past year, because of our resiliency of our farming program and our tracking of yields relative to county, we were able to participate in a lesser expensive crop insurance program that saved me 675 an acre on the corn acre. So when I put that together, balanced out, that's a $22 bill that I figure I can attribute in here to, to help offset that $22 or that $27 cost. Then I reevaluate it. We're looking at a net dollar, $138 an acre. That's significant. And you can put your own figures in there and, and do your own math. But in our operation, I figure that's, you know, the economics and I figure it's pretty close. So in short, you know, we've lowered our cost of production. We've lowered our N and P loss. And I, you know, asterisk the public benefits because I don't think anybody wants those in their water. We've lowered the amount of water runoff, definitely beneficial to our downstream neighbors. We've lowered soil loss. We've kept it on the plane. Reduced our yield variability. That was an unexpected uh, benefit that came out of that long-term study. Improved our soil structure. We've raised soil carbon levels. And in consequence, we've reduced atmospheric carbon. And we've maintained yields. And that's still critical. We got to be able to adopt conservation and still keep yields up because we've got an ever-growing population and someday we might have over die 9 billion miles to feed. And, and basically soil that's productive raising crops only six inches deep and that's all that covers this whole globe. And so it's important that we, we take care of and have good quality soils. Final thoughts, you know, we got a new administration. And so there's, you know, a lot of thinking going about here and, and where ag agriculture is gonna be involved with the with this new administration. And we all know climate's gonna be a major focus. Is it gonna be an opportunity or a challenge? You know, for me, it possibly an opportunity. For some, it's gonna be a challenge. Some farmers are gonna find this to be a, a real challenge trying to adopt, you know, to opportunities that might be offered. Carbon credit trading is evolving. There's several companies out there that are, are offering the opportunity to, to harvest and, and, and trade carbon and, and bring some dollars back to the farm. Carbon trading for farmers with additionality. And I'm gonna put the next one up here. How do we fairly treat farmers for permanence? In other words, the, the early adapters. What I'm finding out myself personally, and I've been at this a long time, I do not qualify for a carbon trading program because I do not bring additionality to the picture. They want to adopt farmers that are still conventional, that are still working the ground because it's a better story for them to tell. They can say, well, we, we have created change as well as a sequestered carbon because they can 
you remember the change from tillage to no tillage, you got that bump and then, the, then you've got the additional carbon that accumulates every year. In our operation, yeah, we have carbon that we sequester every year, but they figure we're gonna do it anyway. So it's not additionality. You know, I, I run into fellow farmers that are doing like I do that say, well, we still got a plow out back. I suppose we could undo what we've done. Then we would qualify for additionality. I don't think that's what we want to see happen. And so as we get into these discussions of, of, of carbon and, and, and legislation and farm bill and, and so forth, we got to come up with a way, you know, to treat farmers about the permanence of, and maintaining permanence of the practices that we've, you know, took many, many years to adopt. You know, how do we quantify the sequestration of carbon? Some programs are gonna go into a very deep dive of soil analysis. Other programs are gonna take a practice-based approach. In other words, we know that if you, you do no-till and strip-till and you have a good cover crop and you plant green, on average, you're gonna sequester so much carbon a year and provide so much water quality benefits. Uh, it might vary up and down, but over the long-term average. So there's a couple different ways to look at it and different programs look at it different ways. Crop insurance data, you know, I mentioned that in that in that bell curve on the soybeans that there's that that low end pop of the curve that that is the high risk area for crop insurance companies. USDA and the last farm bill was was commissioned with the duty of doing analysis between RMA and FSA, those federal agencies, with the data they have to to verify that there is indeed a benefit to these systems and the possibility of reducing crop insurance rates for farmers who adopt them. What is gonna to happen to biofuels? You know, they, the, the mandate ahead is all electric for the federal government. Uh, we see electric coming on the on horizon, but you know, we have a huge biofuel industry and there's a lot of advantages to biofuels to reducing the carbon impact. And with that, you got feedstock scoring. You know, if you want to follow the life cycle from farm to the fuel tank, uh, those of us farmers that, you know, I sell most of my corn to an ethanol plant, so it's processed into ethanol and, and then DDGs for livestock feed. Um, would my corn be worth more per bushel? Uh, simply because it has a better carbon story. That's a possibility. What's going to happen to crop acres? The, the, Grain prices have dramatic, rose dramatically here in the past uh, three, four months, you know. So planted acres we know are going to go up of all crops. CRP was probably going to come down. So we're probably going to lose some grass, some stored carbon uh, to going back into row crop. You know, so that's a concern that we got to be thinking about. Tie-in precision agriculture to climate discussion. I've seen some good data come out of there that you know, really substantiates that farmers that have adopted this very precision ag uh, equipment that turns off and on at the right time and so forth does uh, help on the carbon discussion. It does uh, put less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So what can you as conservationists do? First of all, I think you need to recognize that soil health is a key asset. I mean, it's a key financial asset to, not only Iowa, but the nation in the world, because healthy soil is, is the only thing that we got to produce the food, fuel, feed, and fiber that is going to be needed to support 9 billion people. Understand that carbon is the key component of soil health. Understand that cover crops are also a key component for improving soil health, in addition to water quality. There's been this attempt to separate water quality and soil health into two different discussions. And I'll tell you folks, anything that we do to improve water quality will also improve soil health. And likewise, anything that a farmer adopts to improve soil health is going to improve water quality. They work together. And so we need to, to cooperate and do research and work together. Be aware that full width tillage is the most often detrimental to soil health. And that folks, that is the biggest impediment to rapid adoption of cover crops across Iowa. is farmers are in love with their tillage equipment, they're scared to move forward for fear of yield loss, fear of being not successful, fear of looking bad in the neighborhood, just they're full of fear. 
And so much of the speaking that I do is try to instill in them that we can make this work. Think outside the box. How do we support farmers in making the change in farming practices necessary to build soil health? And finally, be a part of the conversation. Okay. And that's what we're doing tonight. We're having a conversation. You're hearing from a farmer's side of view or farmer's point of view what, what he sees. And uh, I'm looking forward to the, the questions that might come forth. Folks, hopefully if we move in the right direction, we can avoid another one of these. Folks, that's up my story and we can move to questions. Take it away, Bud. If there's any questions, uh, please put them in the chat box. Okay, looking. Christine, we also have people go down to the reaction button on the uh, bottom of their screen and click on that. And there's a, you can raise a hand if you have a question you want to vocalize as well. True. Okay, that's good too. Okay, a question for uh, from uh, let's see. Okay, first question from John Weiss: How much do bioreactors slow the flow? They're designed to not be an impediment to flow. In other words, there is a bypass mechanism in them. So if you get into a heavy rain and you need to to uh, get that water off the field. Uh, a portion of that will bypass in the control structure. Uh, they're designed to be uh, operational uh, at lesser than full field capacity. So uh, that always has to get averaged into the loss, but uh, yeah, they will not impediment, be impediment to your tile drainage system when you need it the most. Okay, next question from Mike Delaney. Uh, wow, how much did you reduce your end costs? We have been at MRTN, marginal rate to nitrogen, which has been the university recommendation. Uh, in studies or in a, a survey that has been a part of a lot of uh, the Iowa landscape, a ma major part of farmers are above that considerably. And so our end cost uh, has been at you know, roughly that, you know, $20 or $18 an acre less than what has been conceived. Uh, a lot of fellow farmers are applying. But not to say they are doing wrong. Um, we, we, done a, we have done plus 50 trials. In other words, every year we've uh, put an additional 50 unit on in a replicated trial format to see what we're learned. Uh, over eight trials, um, we're seeing a yield boost of 10 bushel an acre or a net advantage of about $18 an acre. And so you sit here and struggle mentally with, wow, you know, I can make more money by putting some more nitrogen on. But I can quantify that we don't lose much because we've got a cover crop uh, on every acre. And I think you know, that's the story that needs to be moved more than the discussion about the actual amount of nitrogen. Because in talking with Matt Helmers from Iowa State University, he has strong feeling that if you got a good, good cover crop growing out there, a cereal rye that's going to overwinter and be there the next spring, you're going to capture any unused nitrogen that that corn crop doesn't use. So I think rather than to battle the farmers on their nitrogen rates, that it's probably better battled to encourage cover crop use on, on that crop. And, and we're going to keep that nitrogen and, and put it in an organic form and probably benefits, you know, the next crop somewhere along the way or help build soil organic matter. So it, it's a, it's a, I call it the nitrogen conundrum because, um, you know, eight years of trials and, and we're going to go to a higher rate of nitrogen this year, but we're going to have replicated trial on every single field. And we'll also follow a stock nitrate testing and gather the data and let the data take us where it goes. Um, there's been this question that's been going on, you know, are the hybrids that we are coming out with ones that are really power, you know, powerhouses that respond better to nitrogen? 
you know, our higher nitrogen, you know, I had a, a split trial last year with additional 50 units, which would be around 200 bush or 200 pounds per acre. One hybrid and one half of the planter responded by 30.7 bushels per acre and the other responded by 10.2. Two different hybrids, two different response curves. Most of them made money economically. And I'm sitting here thinking, I'm looking at soil health is going up, organic matter is going up. You know, I can't, I can't answer the story. And so I, I, I do understand why nitrogen rates seem to be high. But I also quantify that to justify it, I think you need to have a cover crop behind it. And uh, you'll capture it in the cover crop and it won't be in our streams. And so I, you know, I think that's the message we need to work a little harder on. Um, well, we start talking about restricting uh, nutrients and I think we'll lose too many people in the, in the conversation. That's just my opinion. Uh, Let's uh, move on to the next question here. Uh, on depth of organic matter, this from John Norwood, is that increasing? The depth? Yes. Our, our sampling has always been the same depth, so I can't tell you about, you know, down in the field. The biggest response is going to be in the, you know, if I look at the research information out of Iowa State University, the biggest response occurred in the top 12 inches. There was smaller response down below, but the biggest response is in the top 12. All right. Uh, this question from Nancy Gladden uh, in regards to cover crops. What about the costs associated with using herbicides if you need to kill off the cover crop? It's almost in, it's about three bucks an acre because we're out there in a no-till situation doing a burn down of existing weeds and you know, less than $3 an acre provides the added amount of, of chemical needed to, to terminate that great big cereal rye but it, it's rather insignificant. Okay, um, Christine, we're getting quite a few more questions. I, I have six unposed. Um, how long do we want to keep taking questions? I'm open, so well, um, I'll stick around. Yeah, okay, what about, um, but if you, want, I guess I could read questions if you, because we we were um, kind of cutting off at eight, but anybody who wants to stay on, we can certainly follow through. Um, but do you, if you need to go, um, either Chris or I can- um, uh, I can stay on for a bit longer. And answer now. I can stay on for a bit longer, but okay. it, it, I need to eat, bottom line. I haven't <laughs> ate yet, but okay. so we can go to <laughs> Absolutely. I can um, take I can take the next one, Bud, and we'll get you uh, off when you need to go. How about that? This is okay. Chris well, thank you for that, and thank you to everybody for joining. Thanks, Bud. Yeah, thanks, Bud. So Chris Henning is going to take over on the question and answer. Thank you. Okay, I think that maybe we got part of this one. John Norwood asking. Uh, a question on whether the with the nitrogen levels going down in the tile water, is that consistent over the year? And uh, where do you think that nitrogen is going? It, and I think that maybe you said it's going into the cover crop. Do you want to address that for a minute, Wayne? Yeah, that's the assumption that we've, uh, the cover crop is, is sequestered that nitrogen and put it in an organic form so that uh, basically we brought it up from, you know, the depths below and um, we give an opportunity to uh, add it either to organic matter or the production system uh, in the current year or the next, you know, it's, uh, we're trying to capture it and, and, and reuse it in the field. Okay. And Dale Braun would like to know about harvesting the rye seed and reusing each year and what about other types of cover crops? So I think he's maybe talking about multi-species and uh, whatever. When you plant uh, green, 
do you terminate before it seeds out then? We terminate before the crop comes up. That meets our crop insurance requirements in Iowa. And so uh, we typically will plant and it's, as soon as I'm done planting, we turn around and terminate then the cover crop. So um, it usually takes you a week, 10 days for a crop or a week to two weeks for the crop to come up. So you've got a window in there for which you can terminate that crop. Okay. And do you use anything besides cereal rye or have you tried anything besides cereal rye? This year we mixed cereal rye and oats. Um, about a fourth of the mix was oats and the other was cereal rye. Uh, that's primarily just to, to bring in a different bacteria, the mycorrhiza, fungi and so forth to, to encourage a little better uh, uh, growth of them in the profile. Um, you get up this far north and planting as late as we do, our options for multi-species are, are not as great as they are when you get into more Southern climates. Um, and we tried multi-species when I said, when we started experimenting in 2012, that's when we were working, we were working with rye and, and radishes and crimson clover and a lot of those mixes, uh, considerably more expensive and we had very little luck. Um, sometimes the radishes would grow a year or two years later uh, in the field, you know, in another crop and so forth. So it's, it's a learning process and, and due to the expenses of it um, and the success, I've never had a failure with cereal rye. And so we're trying to perfect our working with that and, and maybe start to work in, you know, some other mix. Few, a few people up here are running cereal rye and rape ahead of corn, uh, you know, to get that, you know, that other species in there. Uh, a lot of them are running just straight oats or early fall seeded. Uh, or oats and maybe some radishes that win, but those winter kill. Um, anything that winter kills though is, I feel we're losing the, the sequestering advantage of reducing nitrates uh, coming out of tile drainage systems. I, I think the real benefit there is, is, is especially cereal rye, something we can take and plant green into before we terminate it. and. Uh, We've probably done the best job we can then about keeping nitrates out of our tile drainage water with that methodology. But um, things that winter kill or multi-species stuff, um, you know, not quite so. And, and most of the multi-species stuff are, are gonna be providing nitrogen. Um, and if we're concerned about sequestering nitrogen, that's two different things. Right. It all depends on what your goals are. Good, thank you. Um, Andrew Dunham is asking a question about livestock and his um, statement is that it seems that putting perennials onto erodible ground would make more sense than planting annuals and letting the livestock harvest their own forage rotate onto cover crop ground and save on fossil fuels. Oh, um, I don't dis yeah, I don't disagree and uh, of course you know, parts of Iowa, that's where your uh, permanent pasture and stuff are. And uh, the question comes um, to what level of erodibility are, are you worried about? We're, we don't have any highly erodible soils where I farm. And so, uh, that, you know, that's not to say that we still don't uh, or can't have erosion concerns, but uh, uh, we're seeing more livestock come back. And I think uh, in some cases we're seeing with the cover crops uh, opportunities to to string some electric wire around some of these cover crop fields. And uh, especially the guys that got cow calf herds to uh, uh, get a little extra uh, feed out of that and also uh, recycle some of the manure uh, from the how herd, cow herds. So um, I, I think the trend is, is for more livestock back on the land. It, it just- uh, We're it'll, seeing it'll a lot come, of that over- period. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of that over here in Greene County where I live as well. The biggest problem being that um, that fencing business, and then of yep. course water on the land. Yep, you um, gotta have both. You gotta have both, and um, getting the cows from um, the cow calf herd from uh, a mile and a half away down to the uh, cover crop farm is the next thing too. Um, Wayne Webb asks about. Um, 
back to uh, bioreactors, is there a dissolved oxygen in the bioreactor re effluent? I can't answer that. <laughs> you know, they answered, they, they checked for the nitrate and the phosphorus and that's what we checked for. Yeah, you know. we have a bioreactor too. I hadn't heard of that, one, that question. Uh, yeah, Charlie yeah. Palmgren is asking um, about uh, what is uh, Vilsack stance on cover crops. And I'm thinking that Vilsack's right. um, stance on cover crops in 2008 was very, very encouraging. Yeah. Um, have you heard anything about it this time? No, Vilsack will be very supportive of, uh, of the cover crops and uh, climate and carbon and you know that's that's primary reason he came back uh, to this administration. He gave up a million dollar a year job to go back and work for USDA for two hundred seventy thousand a year. Um, he had to be asked twice, you know. Um, so he's definitely there to to help facilitate Biden's climate plan and carbon plan. And you know, the the thing is to get a plan that where the farmers benefit as well as you know the the atmosphere and and what we're trying to do but um, too many of these programs uh, could all go to a middleman if you don't watch how it's arranged and uh, we want to see you know benefits to the farmers and incentives that, that work down to encourage more adoption on the farmers and enough payments to help through the learning curve as i demonstrated you can have learning curves in this process and uh, um you need to get people through there because if you have a really severe learning curve, you go broke pretty fast. Marilyn McNair, we're coming up on 815, Christine, and I've got five or six more questions. Um, I'm thinking if the rest of you have I'm questions. Fine. So, okay, I'm fine, if we so. have more questions, you put them in the chat and we'll make sure that Wayne gets them and gets them back out to us. Um, but we'll get the, the ones we've got here. Marilyn McNabb is uh, asking about water quantity, given the increases in intensity of rain because of climate change, is anybody studying the effects of downstream flooding in towns and cities? And is anybody trying to measure the effects of flooding, effects on, cover crops have on flooding, I think is what you're asking, right, Marilyn? Mm -hmm. Anyway, is anybody trying to measure the effects of cover crops on flooding? And I know over at the flood center, Chris Jones is doing a whole lot of um, studying on, on what practices are doing on, um, on the land. I, I don't know if he's doing anything particular on cover crops or not. Oh, I think so. I know, I've known, I know Chris. Chris used to work for Iowa Soybean. He used to run yeah. our water lab. And, um, and basically the concept is um, good healthy soil is 50% is, uh, air. Good healthy structured soil has 50% airspace in it. So there's a lot of capacity in that to hold rain. But poor structured soil has much, much less capacity because there's no, there's no pore space to it, it's collapsed. And so as we build the soil health, this is, where, this is how the soil health and water quality relate. As you improve your soil health, you improve the ability of the soil to absorb and hold more water. And when you do get a sudden rain, you have a bigger sponge. And, that, and that's the whole idea, you know, is to create a bigger sponge on the landscape. And if we can create a bigger sponge, less water goes down there in a, in a flash. Now the water is going to eventually come out through drainage systems and so forth. But the idea is to create that huge sponge so that when you do get them heavy rainfalls, we, we take that heavy flooding effect away for the downstream. And that's why cities like Cedar Rapids and so forth have been really participatory in this RCPPP program where they, they see the advantages of working with the upstream farmers and, and producers. Number one, we can improve and, and reduce the amount of nitrates in their drinking water, but we can also improve, build a bigger sponge up here to help protect them when it comes to flooding. That's right. Okay. Um, Julie Lay would like to know if you use other fertilizer on your farm to, 
to increase organic matter. She heard you mention potash. Yeah, we, 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 you know, we used, you know, we used to have livestock. And so we had a lot of, you know, livestock manures and so forth, but I retired from that in 2007, you know, I'll be 70 at the end of this month. So I didn't figure I had to work that hard all my life. And, uh, you know, so, you know, I work with a crop consultant and, and so we're working with uh, fertilizer recommendations, but they typically have been at sufficiency rates, not replacement rates. And they're two different things. Uh, if you look at what some, L some fertilizer dealers would say replacement rates are, well, there's so much phosphorus and potash and nitrogen in a bushel of corn, you harvest 200 bushel of corn, this is the amount of fertilizer you got to put back. We have found that a good, vibrant, healthy soil creates a lot of its own fertility. And, and it, it, it pulls a lot of potash and, and, and phosphates and stuff from lower in the system, especially if you use some deep rooted cover crops and so forth. We can maintain sufficient yields and not see soil tests go down and not have to put on as high of fertility rates. I think it, that's, a, that's a win win there. As I said, you know, over that 18 years, we, we put on about $9 worth less P and K than what's recommended by Iowa State University. And our yeah. yields look traveled very well. Yeah. Okay. So Mary Davis um, is asking this business about um, harvesting. Is it not cost effective to harvest the cover crop and sell it? Some do. Uh, some farmers have chosen here to, uh, especially on some of their really uh, poorer land, uh, thinner land, you might say a more erosive land than that. Uh, because we have a cover crop business here just five miles away. Um, they've done about 40 to 50,000 acres worth of, of cover crop business last year. They have a huge need for seed. Um, up until uh, recently, a lot of that seed come out of North Dakota. Uh, now right. we're starting to see a lot of it locally raised. And so uh, a lot of farmers are raising seed, cover crop seed, and most of that they're they're putting on some of their less productive land because uh, they can get a better return for that. We've got also them, some that are experimenting with relay cropping. Whereas they'll seed uh, their cover, they'll, they'll seed cereal rye in the fall and they'll seed it in rows. And then in April, they will no-till soybeans into the gaps between those rows and then in July, they'll come in and harvest the rye off the top for seed. And then in the fall, harvest the beans. Yep. It's an interesting concept. It's like a double crop system. Uh, they're finding that, you know, they've got more gross income and more net income as well in that type of concept. So we got some really creative people in the neighborhood that are trying some, some neat stuff. And, uh, Gets the a, early gets adopter, the early adopters will always try to figure out which way they can do it the best too. That's well, it's it, it's just a fun group to be involved with. But we know that if we're going to get the cover crops we need across this state, we got to build another whole infrastructure, and it's going to be a cover crop business infrastructure, and that's going to involve seed. It's going to involve applicators and, and you know planes and drills and. You know, you can't cover that acres, uh, you know, without, you know, a huge infrastructure. And so that's, that's in the, it's in the early stages of growing and growing faster. Okay, a couple, a couple more, and then I'm going to finish up. John Norwood, you've got way too many great questions. So I'm going to finish up with your King of Iowa one, but I've got to add, I want these other two. Um, have you shortened the maturity of the corn and beans that you plant? And do you measure the fungi and bacteria ratio? And I don't remember hearing, you've talked about the mycorrhizome and so forth, but I don't remember that you talked about measuring it. No, so those I have. two questions. I have. Yeah, I haven't measured that. Uh, and yeah, as far as maturities, uh, we're moving a little earlier on the soybeans so we can get uh, our, our rye uh, drilled a little quicker. Uh, you know, we had really good opportunity this year. Um, but if you can get beans out 
you know, more in later September rather than mid October, you got a lot of a lot of time benefit there for the cereal rye to, to get a good start in the fall and be a lot more beneficial the following year. We okay. fly our rye into corn, so that's that's less of a concern. We usually like to fly third week of August on. And do you not fly in into uh, the soybeans? We're 15 inch beans. I haven't had a lot of success doing that. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people do. Um, okay. Uh, Carolyn Van Schulk, maybe, uh, mentions the Midwest Grazing Exchange that helps farmers with land to graze find farmers with livestock needing grazing. And I might also uh, mention that um, not only in your area up there in the north, um, north country, Wayne, but down here uh, in Greene County, we have uh, young people who are uh, starting cover crop um, enterprises and um, several, several, the one closest to me is um, uh, two young people with cow calf herds who started their cover crop business uh, so that they could um, use it for forage. And now they fly on, um, cover crops for the rest of us all all across this corner of the state so um infrastructure and these new exchanges um are really really helpful and and then we're going to finish up with this great question if you were the king of iowa wayne and you hmm. could wave your magic wand and all landowners and operators had to follow your instructors, what would you say? What would you want to see? Okay. I, <laughs> you only I would, get, you only I would get like, five minutes, right? I would like, <laughs> what I think would be most successful in, in moving the needle would some, be some longer term thinking especially with landowners. I would think number one, as we sit down and, and look at the opportunities that are available. And, and I, when I look at uh, what's available for cost share money through NRCS and those programs, um, you can find three to five year uh, cost share programs that are available. We don't have three to five year leases out here. So I think number one, we need to uh, engage in landowners. We need to set up a lease. We need to have a duration of five years on this lease. Number two, I think we need to engage our lender in that same discussion. And then number three, we engage our, you know, with our uh, NRCS uh, and our cost share programs. And you can put together a package there, whereas, um, you know, if the farmer has a problem a year one or two, like I did, and things don't move smoothly, he's not worried about number one, the banker pulling out from under him, or number two, the, the landlord taking away his, his farm or so forth, it, it, because there's a learning experience to this, and there needs to be the opportunity to make a mistake and not be penalized so severely for it. Now, when I talk about a five-year lease, I, I also recognize that, you know, this needs to be a flex lease or something that recognizes change in market prices and so forth, because that certainly can happen during that five-year period. But just the knowledge, I think when you talk to any farmer, the longevity is what has been the, the real holdup for, for really making conservation progress. But if he sit here and, and says or knows that, I got a five year window on this piece of ground, then it starts to make sense about changing this tillage practices and so forth. And that, well, then it might make sense that I, you know, grow, go trade for a no-till planter or I go, uh, you know, buy a strip till machine because, you know, I got a, there you can get three year money through man, cost share through NRCS to help offset some of that cost. And I know they offer up to five years if you go multi-species on, on cover crop, but that's the problem we've had is we got these one-year leases out here and people, you know, and we also got landowners who don't understand, um, 
you know, where this soil health and, and water quality and, and cover crops and how this all interacts. And, and so I think there's a real lack of uh, knowledge that is, is happening in that realm as well. So, you know, if I was, you know, like I said, King for a year, you know, I would really push the five-year commitments and I would really push the education of the non-operating landowners and, uh, and, and get the, the banking and the financial industry engaged in this. We already got NRCS, they're there. Uh, you know, they'd like to see and do everything they could to advance conservation, but uh, we got to get two more groups that's uh, going to help, you know, uh, instill some safety net. And it might be what you call a five-year safety net. That sounds great. That sounds great. Great thanks to you, Wayne, for a great, easy to understand and fascinating presentation. And well, thank you. Uh, thank you. for all the great questions, what a what a great Very group. Good question. Yeah. And yeah. thank you all for uh, making the UMR watershed a great place to live and to farm. <laughs> yeah. A big um, shout out to everybody that took time to join us this evening. I know uh, evenings are precious and um, everybody is completely zoomed out. Um, yeah. <laughs> I know we've been on, most of us have been on Zooms throughout the day and throughout the weeks. And so um, we're super grateful for um, all of you joining us and um, for Tim's efforts and for Chris Henning who was 24-7 um, trying to save the watershed as well. And Wayne, uh, wow, you are a hero. And um, our Thank goal you. is to completely, completely showcase and make celebrities. Um, you need to be a household name in Iowa. And um, <laughs> the, the rest of the people like you who are doing good things for your farm and for Iowa and for our planet is um, so important. And, so we're going to continue to amplify and showcase people like you. And uh, that's, that's our goal. Well, well, thank you. Appreciate it. I've enjoyed working with Tim. And, and uh, any support we can use for uh, codifying soil health in the Iowa legislature would be beneficial as well. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, Thanks, Christine. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So Wayne has his uh, email. You have our email. If anybody would like to um, have, um, you know, additional information, please email us. Um, and we will continue our discussions. We're confirming um, the next uh, session, which is going to be the next Tuesday of March, which I believe is uh, March second so um stand by and you'll be getting um, updated information so um everybody have a beautiful evening and thank you again and I'll, um so we'll sign off and um mm -hmm. it's amazing that over half the people stayed with us um way past it's almost 8 30 and uh we were going to have everybody out of here by eight so we're super grateful for your you know you guys all sticking with us so have a Must beautiful not have been evening. Too boring anyway. <laughs> no, it was beautiful. It was great. It, much better than watching the the news these days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tim, this, this is, is Charlie. This is... I owe you a call. All I'm right, Charlie. Call. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, Christine. Yes, absolutely. Have a beautiful evening, everybody, and thank you again. <laughs>